Hello everybody in internet land, this is Keith Tanner from Fly Miata, and today I'm going to talk about brake rotors. Not the most exciting part of a brake system, but it's a pretty important part of the brake system. So, as always, if you have questions or comments or you want, you want to know something specifically, throw them in the comments when we're shooting this live. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, in the future, we'll do our best to answer them in the comments. And of course, if you like this kind of, uh, this kind of content, like, comment, subscribe. We've got a YouTube channel, we've got a Facebook channel, we've got Instagram. I think we might even have Twitter. Oh, good Lord. Anyway, you know, we're easy to get in touch with. So, brake rotors. The job of the brake rotor is actually a pretty tough one. It's not a very complicated part of your braking system, but it sees a lot of abuse. All of the torque for the braking goes through the rotor. I mean, this is the thing that gets grabbed hold of to slow the car down. It sees massive temperatures, um, and it undergoes massive pressures because you've got your calipers are squeezing the brake pads against the surface of the rotor to slow things down, and it's the friction right there that, uh, that slows the car down. So this thing is seeing enormous pressures, enormous heat, and enormous torque. So it's a fairly important piece from that regard. So um, even though they're a relatively straightforward piece, there's a lot of different things to know about rotors. There's a lot of different kinds of rotors on the market. And this, what I'm going to try to do today is explain why some of them are built the way they are, the advantages of different types, etc. So rotors are almost exclusively made of cast iron, gray cast iron. There are carbon fiber rotors out there, or carbon rotors out there, there's metal matrix composite, that sort of thing, but we're talking about Miatas here, um, so we're only going to be talking about cast iron rotors at the moment. There can be some differences in metallurgy, mostly in terms of quality, I think. Um, you know, if you get a, a really good rotor made by a really good foundry, the metallurgy, such as these Spec 37s I've got here, or with these GT48s, these Willwood rotors, um, these ones I believe are made in the US, uh, very good quality steel. You can get yourself some less expensive ones that may or may not have the same quality of steel of iron in them. Um, but fundamentally, as long as they stay, they don't have any weird incursions in them, as long as they stay dimensionally accurate, not a big important thing. So the first thing I'll talk about, speaking of dimensionally accurate, is warped rotors. Now this is the thing that a lot of people think that the rotors are actually going to taco themselves and end up being not flat anymore, but really that doesn't happen. What, you, what mostly happens is uneven pad deposits or uneven thickness. Some of that is quality of machining in the first place, but a lot of it comes from basically just build up of pad material on the rotors. Because you do build up a layer of pad material on the rotors. That's what's actually making contact with the pads, and that's part of bedding the brakes. And if you don't bed them properly, you can end up with a poor, uh, a poor layer of brake pad material. Uh, and that can lead to, you know, if it's, if it's not evenly distributed, that leads to a little bit of pulsing. Um, that extra thickness will, sort of like a flat spot on a tire, it'll exaggerate itself over time. It'll get worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, so one cause for warped rotors is basically poorly bedded pads. Um, another one can be parking when, it's super, when your pads are super hot because they're still lightly in contact with the rotor and they will basically brand themselves onto the rotor. I mean, we've all heard that when you're autocrossing, you don't park and put the handbrake on because you've seen that puff of smoke that comes out of the rear rotors or the rear wheels. But it's true even if you come off the track and everything is super hot and you, do, you don't do a cool down lap. That's one of the reasons for a cool down lap is to let things cool down. Um, if your brakes are still extremely hot, they can leave a deposit on the rotor and eventually that's going to come back and bite you. Another thing that can happen is overheated pads, and then you get, uh, you get weird deposits, like little splotches all over, the, uh, all over the rotor. Same thing, these end up being sort of thick spots, and they, they sort of build on themselves over time. It gets worse and worse. Um, so if you do have a warped rotor, uh, one of the best things you can do, you can also get it from corrosion, for example. Um, if you're parked for a long time, in a, uh, especially in a, in a very wet climate, um, the pads can actually weld themselves or corrode themselves directly to the rotor, and that will, again, same sort of problem, you'll end up with a buildup, etc. So the solution for most of that is to turn them. Um, if it comes from an overheated rotor, which it can, if you overheat the rotor too much, you can get into localized changes in the metallurgy. And if that happens, I mean, if, it, if you've overheated the rotor and you've got those, those little, I forget what it is, the buildup of, um, I'm sure we're going to have a metallurgist jump in and tell us what it is, carbonation or something in there. Um, I forget what it was, what it's called. Anyhow, at that point, your rotor's pretty much done. If it's based on pad buildup, turning it can usually clean that off and get you going again. But in many cases, sometimes your rotor is just plain done. So, that's a, do we have any questions yet, guys? Comments? Nope? Okay. So, now rotor diameter 
is a fairly obvious difference. Well, let's look at these two guys here. Um, this is a stock 1.6 front, I think, and this is a big brake kit from an ND, I think, somewhere around there. Um, obviously, diameter is important. We're not going to talk about diameter here today because that's part of specifying a big brake kit or specifying your brake kits overall. Right now, all we're concerned about is that you are the correct rotor diameter for wherever your caliper is sitting. Um, but this diameter does immediately affect brake torque. If you put the same pad on here with the same amount of clamping force on these two, you will get more brake torque out of this one because it's got a longer lever arm. Um, but that's not really, I mean, that's just, that's part of the design of a brake kit. What's more interesting about rotors is their role as a heat sink. Because all of the, all your braking, what you're doing is you're turning your, your um, momentum into heat. And uh, <laughs> that's... That heat's got to go somewhere, and the first place it goes, and the best for, place for it to go, is into the rotor. This thing is meant to be a heat sink, and that's why they're made of cast iron. They have a good mass, they have good heat capacity, um, and that heat has to go away. So the rotor takes it, it absorbs it, and then it basically gets rid of it. And there's three ways it can do that. One is by conduction, which is like you touching a hot thing. That's basically direct contact with something else, um, and the heat is conducted from one to the other. And so, you know, on a, on a rotor like this, this gets hot. So the center starts getting hot. That starts heating up your wheel bearings and your hub. Um, the, the pads get heated up by the rotor. The caliper gets heated up. The brake fluid gets heated up. Obviously, you don't want too much of that going on. We talked about brake fluid in a previous, uh, previous video. But that's one way it gets rid of the heat. Another way is by convection, which is basically airflow. Think of, you know, the hot air blowing over a heater, and you get, that's how you get the hot air. Um, the, the airflow over the rotor and through the rotor pulls the heat out of it and gets rid of it, throws it away in the air. The other one is radiation, which is, I mean, you put your hand near something that's hot, you can feel the heat coming off it, that's radiation. And that's basically just it bleeding heat out of, say, through the, the wheel or something. The higher the temper differential, the hotter it gets, the more effective those last two are. Um, when it's fairly cold outside, most of it is just done by conduction, or when you're just driving on the street, when you're on the track and your brakes are literally growing red, that's going to be radiation convection that helps you out there. And I'm going to, there's a reason I got all nerdy about that, and that's because we're going to be talking about the convection side of things, which is venting. So, this is a rear brake from Miata, and it's a solid rotor, as you can tell. It's just a, the rear brakes don't do a lot of work compared to the front. And so this one doesn't need a whole lot of thermal mass. It doesn't need to get rid of a lot of heat. And so it's fairly small, it's thin, it's light, relatively speaking. Um, so it doesn't need to do a lot of work. But in the front, that's where all the excitement happens. And at that point, we have a whole bunch of heat getting put into this thing. And we need to get rid of it. And so that's the role of a vented rotor, which basically it has a series of vents on the inside. And uh, it's designed to pull air from the center of the rotor outwards like a big fan. And that's what cools the rotor. It doubles the amount of surface area that's in there, plus the actual vents themselves and pulls a lot more air because it's actively acting as a fan. Uh, there's several different kinds of, I don't know if you can see this, Travis, several different kinds of veins you can see on this. Well, here we'll use this one, it's brighter. This one, is, this one has straight veins in it. I don't know if you can actually see it, but the veins themselves are just straight lines in and out. This is fairly, fairly common, it's uh, effective, it's inexpensive. You can see, use the same rotor on the left or right. If you go in the higher end, like this GT48, this one has curved veins. So the veins themselves are shaped like little fan blades almost. Um, and so they're more effective at pulling the air through the rotor. The downside is they're directional, so you need to have a left rotor and a right rotor, um, which of course increased costs. And isn't amazing how that always happens. The better it works, the more it costs. So there are, and there are, there are other companies, uh, I think DBA talks about their kangaroo paw. Um, veins and that kind of thing. There's, there's a fair bit of science goes into the design of these veins, but as long as you've got something, it's better than nothing, which is what you've got in a solid rotor. And the other obvious thing, so obviously, I mean, if you're buying, you're buying rotors for your Miata, you're going to get vented um, rotors for the front simply because you're not going to be able to find a solid rotor this fat. So this is all stuff that you don't really have a choice for. Now we're getting the stuff you've got a choice for. Questions yet, Mike? I am going to talk about drilled and slotted, yes. I'm getting there. Don't want the audience to walk out early. <laughs> so 
you can see an obvious difference here. This is what I'm going to talk about next is one piece versus two piece rotors. Why would you want one versus the other? All Miatas come from the factory with one piece rotors. And that basically means that the hat, the part that goes on the wheel, is one solid piece with the actual rotor face itself. And this is almost every production car is built like this. And the reason is because it's a much less expensive way to make a rotor. That's one casting. It's a very easy thing to do. Um, it also packages better on small rotors. You can see it would be very difficult to actually get any sort of size of brake pad on here if you had a hat with bolts like this one. If you had a design like this and scaled it down, there'd be no room for anything. So they fit up better on smaller brakes. Not so much an issue on modern cars, but you know, back in the 1990s, uh, yeah, that was a thing. So that's one advantage to them. The downside, and this is an interesting one, one of the downsides is it's a two-piece rotor, it's not a two-piece rotor, it's a vented rotor, but this side is attached to the hub, this side is not. You can see there's a gap, there's a gap right here. And that means that there's a difference in the amount of cooling it gets. The inside doesn't have any, uh, any conductive cooling to the hub. It cannot basically transfer any heat from the rotor face to the hub very easily. This one is connected directly to the hub, so it does. So what can happen is you get differential expansion this side heats up more than this side, and the whole thing sort of turns into a cone, almost. And that can lead to poor brake feel, poor braking. On the track, that's basically a problem when your brake rotors start shaping themselves like this on cross-section. So that's a downside to, to um, one-piece rotors. The real upside is they're inexpensive. These things are cheap. I mean, Miata, Miata front rotors in the 1.6 or the 1.8 size, you'll get changed from a 20 if you buy the, the cheap ones at, uh, at Napa or something. Not necessarily the ones that we approve of, but you know, still, you can get cheap ones. Stuff like this tends to be a little more expensive. So you don't go for a two-piece rotor because of the price. You go for a two-piece rotor because, one, they're more flexible in design. Um, you know, we don't have to wait for someone to come up with a one-piece rotor that fits a Miata hub and happens to be this big around and has the right offset and everything like this. All the offset and everything is taken care of by the hat, which is the center section here. This one, it's not supposed to be that loose. It's, this is one I grabbed off my shelf. Um, but the hat takes care of the location of the rotor. It takes care of a generic size rotor ring um, and makes you able to put it on a Miata. So there's a lot more flexibility in design, which opens up the options for a lot more design uh, variations on different cars, especially small production cars like Miatas. Um, they're also more dimensionally stable uh, because if they're designed properly, and if the, uh, I don't know if any of these have slots. If you look at this one carefully, you can't see it very well, but this hole is actually slotted. And that allows the rotor to grow. So the problem we have with this one is the rotor heats up, it's attached on one side, it's, it's, it's not uh, transferring heat properly. This one, as it, as it gets hotter, it's actually allowed to grow in diameter and expand there. And the, uh, the fasteners are designed to allow that to happen. So it's, it's more dimensionally stable. It doesn't have that, it doesn't have that sort of pull, that asymmetric um, heat buildup, or the asymmetric way that it's, it's sort of pulling on the edge of the uh, on the edge of the hat. You can also set it up so there's less heat conducted to the hat and therefore less heat put into your wheel bearings. Um, the downside to that is you get a little more heat in the rotor itself, but that's the place you can get rid of it. Uh, they also, they are lighter. Now you do want mass in a rotor because that is what you store your heat in is the mass, um, but you don't necessarily want it in the wrong place, which is in the center here. Um, if you can just keep the mass where you need it in the ring and make the center lighter, make the, the hat lighter, you can get away with less unsprung and rotating mass um, for the same amount of heat capacity, basically. Um, another nice thing is the, the top hats, these center sections, don't really need to be replaced unless they're worn. Uh, once you start hogging holes out, that kind of thing, obviously they need to be replaced, but generally speaking, these are more or less a forever piece, um, and then you just keep changing the outside ring. Any more questions? Mike? Nope. Nope, okay. So, one piece versus two piece rotors. We use two piece rotors for a bunch of reasons. Basically, fundamentally, they work better. They can work better, but they cost more money. I mean, again, amazing how that works. Now, drilling and slotting. I was not able to come up with an example of a drilled rotor here because we don't believe in them here. Um, basically, back in the day, a long time ago, brake pads used to outgas fairly dramatically when they got hot. They'd, let, they'd release a lot of gases, volatiles, when they got up to temperature, especially when they were first baking in, uh, first bedding in, but also even under hard use. And so 
part of the idea of the drilling the holes was to get rid of that gas so that they wasn't, it wasn't building up between the pad and the rotor face. Um, that's a good concept. Not needed so much anymore. Modern brake pads, they do outgas a little bit, but nowhere near as much as they used to. But what's happened is drilled rotors have become a fashion item. They're the high performance version because that's what was done back in you know, the, the 50s and 60s and whatever. And people like Porsche have adopted it as a status symbol. Um, you know, so don't do it on their actual race cars, you only do it on their street cars. But the idea, you know, the, the, the problem with the holes is that one, it decreases your mass. That can be good, that can be bad. But more importantly, it creates an excellent place for cracks to start. And that is what's gonna kill your rotors. It's not necessarily gonna be worn down. If you're using rotors hard on the track, the, um, the heat, the expansion that's going into them, that's a place for cracks to start. And that's where you will end up losing your rotor. And if you don't spot that crack, your rotor might explode, which is all sorts of fun. Um, so we stay away from drilled rotors for that reason. They are pure fashion and they are a downgrade on the track. So not a, good, not a good choice. Slots on the other hand, they're interesting. They do a lot of the same things. They allow any sort of buildup in any outgassing, any buildup in um, brake dust to be cleared out. Uh, you can see in this one here, this particular very used rotor, um, there's all sorts of, there's brake dust built up on the slot and that's basically brake dust that's not between the pad and the, uh, and the rotor. It also has an interesting little side effect is it almost, it cleans the pad as it goes over. So if you're, it helps prevent the pads from getting um, glazed because it's effectively wiping an incandescent layer of brake, brake pad off every time it goes over. So they actually work to, to help clean the pad a little bit. Um, the downside is that, uh, well, you can get a slightly faster, slightly faster brake wear because of that or pad wear because you are wiping it down a little bit. Um, but gen and you get a little more dust because again, same sort of deal. But generally speaking, this is a way to get all of the effect of slots without all the downsides of slots. One interesting thing to note is that notice how the slots don't go right to the edge. And that's again to prevent them from being a stress riser. If you see a set of rotors where the slot is cut right over the edge, that's where they're gonna crack. They're gonna start on that little notch on the end. So any, any, uh, any rotor you look at, those slots should not go directly to the edge. It should have a little bit of a gap in there. Yeah, the actual shape of the slots, there's a bunch of different crazy, you can see on some race cars, you see little J-shaped ones and different shapes and stuff like this. I'm pretty sure that you get 99% of the effectiveness by just having a straight, um, a straight cut. More importantly, this is much easier to do, so it's less expensive for mass production. Um, you know, for a race car where cost is less of an object, you might be able to spend the extra money if there is a little bit of, of um, extra benefit from having the, the odd shapes. I've not seen any actual documentation on that, so I can't say exactly what effect it will have, but um, my theory is that the reason you see straight ones on most streetcar-based stuff is simply cost. It's just much less expensive to do a straight line. Less expensive in terms of time on the mill, basically. Um, now here's an interesting, I'll show you one more interesting thing before we open up any new questions if anything else has come up. And that is, this is an interesting rotor that got taken off uh, one of my cars that was being used on the street and the track with a set of very aggressive pads, but it didn't have any brake ducting. So you can see the outside of it, there's, some, there's been some, some odd stuff going on here with heat. It was heating up here more than here. This could have been because this is the part that's cooled the most by the airflow. What's really interesting is the amount of ridiculous wear on the inside. This used to be slotted. There you can see the slots right there. And what was happening here is that there was radiation um, cooling on the outside where the wheel is, that's this side here. Um, you had some airflow from the wheel whipping around. You also had the, the easier to radiate the heat. This side was getting hotter and hotter um, because it wasn't able to get rid of the heat as easily. And so it basically overheated the pad and the pad went after the rotor and took it out. Um, fun thing to catch when you pull the rotor off. You think everything's going fine. You discover there's nothing on the backside. Uh, I understand that actually we're talking to Kyle. He says that uh, Dodge trucks can have the same sort of problem as well. Um, because they can be, you know, they're big and heavy and they're towing stuff, so they can be pretty hard on their brakes. And they can do the same thing where they, they wear the inside edge because they don't have even heat rejection on both sides. So brake ducting is an excellent way to, uh, to improve your brakes, to make sure they last longer, to keep them in their operating temperature better. We do sell brake ducting kits for most, if not all, Miatas. Um, and you want to make sure when you are ducting, you don't just blow on the inside edge. You want to actually get as close as possible to the inside of the rotor so it can use its internal fans and pull the air out through it. 
So the only other thing I'm going to mention is going to be paint and coatings. You can see this one here, for example, is coated here. It's got some, uh, it's got some paint on it, nothing on the friction surface. Uh, if there was, it would be taken off pretty quickly by your pads, but it will also probably get a bed in your pads. The only real function of this is to keep it from looking crusty. Um, these things are, you know, they're cast iron, they're sitting outside, they're sitting in a car that, you know, it sees all sorts of weather, and things do, as you can see on this factory one, they do rust. So that's the only real reason that you see coatings like this. Even if you get ones that are coated all over with zinc or whatever it is, um, by the time you've actually run them, they will, uh, they will have a clean and rustable uh, friction surface, uh, and the rest of it will just kind of, it's just aesthetic. So that's why you see various coatings on things like that. Um, that's, their, that's their primary purpose. But they do look nice. It always looks a little rough to have a, a really pretty car sitting out there and then rusty brake rotors on it. Do we have any questions, Mike? Let's take a bonus question. Tell us your favorite brake-related story. Tell you my favorite brake-related story. Hmm. I had a friend who was working with a, uh, with a shop. I don't think they're still around. I'm not going to name them. Um, Canadian big brake manufacturer. And this is a, he was testing it on his BMW M3, an e uh, E30, I think it was. And uh, they gave him a set of brakes to test at Mosport. And they'd got some of the math wrong, and they got the piston sizes wrong. And so he came up to one of the hard braking zones, uh, hit the brakes, the uh, the pads moved too far. He must have worn his uh, must have worn his pads down or something like that. The pistons came out, sprayed uh, flammable brake fluid all over the red hot rotor. So he went screaming off the end of the straight, with uh, his front wheels on fire and no braking left. So I'm glad I'm not that guy. <laughs> Came close once. We were testing some uh, some brake pads from another from a vendor who did not make it into our catalog, and after only one brake session, they were down to paper thin. Um, they would not have survived a session and a half, and I would have been that guy going off the end of the front straight with his wheels on fire. So that's probably my best brake story. Hope that hope that does the job. So I hope this has been useful to you. Um, hope this will help you choose the correct rotors and brakes for your car. As you can imagine for street, this is one of those things is with everything with brakes, for street use, you don't need exotic stuff. You know, there's nothing wrong with a solid rotor. Uh, well, a, vent, a, a one piece rotor um, for street use. But if you are uh, working your brakes hard because either your car is a little bit heavier or more importantly, you're going faster because the load on the brakes goes up with the square of speed and only, the, only directly with, uh, with weight. Um, so the faster you're going, the stickier your tires are, interestingly, uh, the more heat you're putting into your rotor. So the more you need to know about how to be able to tell what features are useful to you and what features are mostly just marketing and bling. So if that helped, um, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, if you'd like more content like this, of course, join up all of our socials, uh, like, comment, subscribe, you know the deal. Um, if you have any technical questions, our technical support team, we've got, uh, what, five people back there who are dedicated to help asking your, answering your questions, um, hit us up. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. My name is Keith Tanner from Fly Miata. See you soon.